welcome. So we are going to move to your presentation. I'm going to introduce, uh, have a big, uh, I'm, I'm very um, thick and rich biography. I'm going to just cut it short. Uh, because Absolutely. We'll to from your presentation. Um, so, um, um, yes. So Asia of, Sorry. Go. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so Asia Stewart is a Brooklyn-based performance artist whose conceptual work centers the body as a living archive. After receiving degrees in the social sciences from Cambridge and Harvard University, she has sought ways to embody abstract sociological theories and transform the language specific to studies of race, gender, and sexuality and also the diaspora into materials that can be felt and worn on the body so um so I, asia i think it's uh, i think it's, it's over to you now and uh, just tell us about your project you are going to share with us um, one of your many wonderful projects uh, is called fabric softener mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction, Marina, and for inviting me to participate in this conference. Um, actually, when Marina first reached out to me about this conference, I was pretty surprised uh, because in my work in past performances, as she said, i am attempted to physicalize abstract concepts related to race, gender, sexuality, and class, but none of my work has explicitly addressed the environment or climate crisis. Uh, yet, when I considered Marina's invitation again, I recognized that we cannot have a conversation about building sustainable environments without addressing race or even returning to the question of how did we get here. And so for the short time that we're together today, I'd like to walk through the ways that Toni Morrison, an author whose work has inspired and appeared in my own performances, has addressed environmental justice in her novels. After doing a reading of two excerpts from her novels, Tar Baby and The Bluest Eye, I will discuss how themes of sustainability and inheritance factor into one of my newest performances entitled Fabric Softener. Uh, so let's begin with the opening passages from the first chapter of Tar Baby. The end of the world, as it turned out, was nothing more than a collection of magnificent winter houses on Isle of the Chevaliers. When laborers imported from Haiti came to clear land, clouds and fish were convinced that the world was over, that the sea green green of the sea and the sky blue sky of the sky were no longer permanent. Wild parrots that had escaped the stones of hungry children in Queen of France agreed and raised havoc as they flew away to look for yet another refuge. Only the champion daisy trees were serene. After all, they are part of a rainforest already 2,000 years old and scheduled for eternity. So they ignored the men and continued to rock the diamond backs that slept in their arms. It took the river to persuade them that indeed the world was altered, that never again would the rain be equal. And by the time they realized it and had run their roots deeper, clutching the earth like lost boys found, it was too late. The men had already folded the earth where there was no fold and hollowed her where there had been no hollow, which explains what happened to the river. It crested, then lost its course, and finally its head. Evicted from the place where it had lived and forced into unknown turf, it could not form its pools or waterfalls and ran every which way. The clouds gathered together, stood still, and watched the river scuttle around the forest floor crash headlong into the haunches of hills with no mention of where it was going, until exhausted, ill, and grieving, it slowed to a stop just 20 leagues short of the sea. When it was over, and houses instead grew in the hills, those trees that had been spared dreamed of their comrades for years afterward, and their nightmare mutterings annoyed the diamondbacks, who left them for the new growth that came to life in the spaces the sun saw for the first time. Then the rain changed and was no longer equal. 
Now it rained not just for an hour every day at the same time, but in seasons, abusing the river even more. Poor insulted broken-hearted river. Poor demented stream. Now it sat in one place like a grandmother and became a swamp the Haitians called Sign the Vils. And which is tit it was, a shriveled fog-bound oval seeping with thick black substance that even mosquitoes could not live near. Scholars do not always foreground the fact that Morrison has always paid close attention to environmental racism in her work. In this passage, she asked readers to consider what had to have happened on the fictional island, the Chevaliers, for the river to congeal into a swamp. Well, as she tells us in the first sentence that begins this chapter, the construction of vacation homes for wealthy white families from abroad catalyzed the quote unquote end of the world or at least the end of the previous world that had existed on this island. And who was building those homes? Laborers imported from Haiti, whose commodification occurs in the afterlife of slavery. And so very quickly, Morrison identifies that modernity and consumerism begin with slavery and engender the unsustainable development and extractive trade practices that haunt the Caribbean to this day. The waste that has accumulated on these islands is not an unfortunate byproduct of capitalism, but a symbol of its success. And the irreparable trauma of slavery brings about irreversible environmental changes on the Isle of the Chevaliers, reminding readers that creation, for some, can have destructive and sometimes apocalyptic consequences for others. With this in mind, let's turn to another section from the opening of Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye. Quiet as it's kept, there were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We thought at the time that it was because Piccola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. A little examination and much less melancholy would have proved to us that our seeds were not the only ones that did not sprout. Nobody's did. Not even the gardens fronting the lake showed marigolds that year. But so deeply concerned were we with the health and safe delivery of Pecola's baby, we could think of nothing but our own magic. If we planted the seeds and said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. It was a long time before my sister and I admitted to ourselves that no green was going to spring from our seeds. Once we knew, our guilt was relieved only by fights and mutual, mutual accusations about who was to blame. For years, I thought my sister was right. It was my fault. I had planted them too far down in the earth. It never occurred to either of us that the earth itself might have been unyielding. There was really nothing more to say except why. But since why is difficult to handle, one must take refuge in how. Here, Morrison references the existence of so many spaces ill-fitted to sustain black life through the metaphor of the hapless marigold seeds. The marigold seeds cannot sprout in a hostile environment that rejected them. Similarly, in the plot of the bluest eye and our world today, black subjects are treated by those around them as disposable and undeserving of life. Morrison's words call to mind how the hazards of unstable polluted housing and inaccessibility of clean water and natural resources subject disenfranchised members of black and brown communities to slow or premature deaths. And of course, in this novel and in our world, there's also a real psychological death that occurs when one is trained to disavow blackness. So when we talk about sustainability, we need to interrogate what it is that we are trying to sustain and reproduce and ask, how do we create environments that affirm, support, and center Black lives? Uh, in turning to my own work here, uh, I have not necessarily answered those two questions, although I challenge you all to continue to reflect on them during and after this conference. I did, however, meditate on the advice and survival strategies I received from my grandmother to create a new performance entitled Fabric Softener. Fabric Softener is an interdisciplinary performance that combines song, movement, and painting to meditate on intergenerational trauma 
and perverse inheritance is passed down by Black mothers. Following my grandmother's passing, I reflected on the advice she had given me while she was alive. Uh, and I realized that all of my grandmother's instructions anticipated future harm and foretold traumas that I would experience as a Black woman growing up in the United States. So using knowledge passed down from Black mother to Black daughter, she trained me essentially to bear and withstand violence. So I've choreographed fabric softener as a baptism that's punctuated by outbursts of spirituals and also excerpts from a 1977 archival recording of Toni Morrison reading from her novel, Song of Solomon. And I've extracted sections of Morrison's reading that focus on the relationship between three characters, a grandmother, mother, and daughter named Pilot, Reba, and Hager. And their story becomes intertwined with my own recollections of growing up with my mother and grandmother in a household filled with, in Morrison's words, women who produced women who produced women without men. Uh, so the, for the rest of our time together today, I'm going to review some of the stills from um, the, one of my first rehearsals of Fabric Softener, and then we'll also be looking at some rehearsal footage too. So uh, throughout Fabric Softener, there's a clothesline that bisects the room or stage. And at the start of the performance, there are 10 white articles of clothing that hang from the clothesline. And all these clothes are either my own or clothes that were essentially hand-me-downs from my mother and grandmother or from friends. Uh, and so I begin the performance by collecting the clothes that hang on this line before beginning my washing cycle. And so I proceed to put on every white garment that is folded in a second wind basket that sits on stage. And I submerge myself in this metal tub that you can see here that's filled with a reddish liquid. And after washing the stained garments in a wooden bowl, I hang them back up on the clothesline and the floor is covered in white linen and it collects a record of everything that splashes and splatters. And so it provides an alternative record of my movement and the performance. Uh, so I'll flick through some of these um, stills here. So you can see different stages of the performance. And these are from the conclusion of the performance here. Uh, and now I'm going to try to, I'm gonna share my screen and share audio so we can watch some of these videos together. They were singing, all of them, Pilot, Reba, and Reba's daughter, Hagar. They were singing some melody that Pilot was leading, a phrase that the other two were taking up and building on, her powerful contralto, Reba's piercing soprano and counterpoint, and the soft voice of the girl, Hagar, who must be about 10 or 11 now, pulled him like a carpet tack under the influence of a magnet. Surrendering to the sound, Macon moved closer. He wanted no conversation, no witness, only to listen and perhaps to see the three of them, the source of that music that made him think of fields and wild turkey and calico. Treading as lightly as he could, he crept up to the side window where the candlelight flickered lowest and peeped in. Reba was cutting her toenails with a kitchen knife or a switchblade, her long neck bent almost to her knees. The girl, Hager, was braiding her hair, while Pilot, whose face he could not see because her back was to the window, was stirring something in a pot. Wine pulp, perhaps. Macon knew it was not food she was stirring, for she and her daughters ate like children, whatever they had a taste for. No meal was ever planned or balanced or served, nor was there any gathering at the table. Pilot might bake hot bread, and each one of them would eat it with butter whenever she felt like it. Or there might be grapes left over from the winemaking. They ate what they had, or came across, 
or had a craving for. Profits from their wine selling evaporated like seawater in a hot wind, going for junk jewelry for Hager, Reba's gifts to men, and he didn't know what all. I wonder where my mother is gone. I wonder where my mother is gone. I wonder where my mother is gone. I heard from heaven today. I heard from heaven today. Heard from heaven today. So we're going to keep cycling through some of these videos without pause. I think that's my connection there. For a dozen years, she had been like his own child. After their mother died, she had come struggling out of the womb without help from throbbing muscles or the pressure of swift womb water. As a result, for all the years he knew her, her stomach was as smooth and sturdy as her back, at no place interrupted by a navel. It was the absence of a navel that convinced people that she had not come into this world through normal channels, had never lain, floated, or grown in some warm and liquid place connected by a tissue-thin tube to a reliable source of human nourishment. Megan knew otherwise because he was there and had seen the eyes of the midwife as his mother's legs collapsed and heard as well her shouts when the baby, who they all believed was dead also, inched its way headfirst out of a still silent and indifferent cave of flesh, dragging her own cord and her own afterbirth behind her. Once the new baby's lifeline is cut, the cord stump shriveled, fell off, and left no trace of having ever existed. Oh. 
And then the final video that we'll watch together is here. No more heads, honey. Lily looked up from the sink as Hager came in. Hager stared. I have to get my hair done. I have to hurry, she said. Lily looked over at Marceline. It was Marceline who kept the shop prosperous. She was younger, more recently trained, and could do a light press that lasted. Lily was still using red-hot irons and an ounce of oil on every head. Her customers were loyal but dissatisfied. Hadn't planned on any late work. I got two more coming. This is my eighth today. No one spoke. Hager stayed. Let's see if I can get this back up. Well, said Marceline, since it's you, come on back at 8.30. Is it washed already? Hager nodded. Okay, said Marceline, 8.30, but don't expect nothing fancy. She probably meant to wait somewhere or go home and return to Lily's at 8.30. Yet the momentum of the thing held her. It was all of a piece. From the moment she looked into the mirror in the little pink compact, she could not stop. It was as though she held her breath and could not let it go until the energy and busyness culminated in a beauty that would dazzle him. And that was why, when she left Lily's, she looked neither right nor left, but walked on and on, oblivious of other people, street lights, automobiles, and a thunderous sky.
thank you for watching those videos with me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and just leave a few uh, closing questions to meditate on. And these are a lot of questions that I've had to sit with as I've been working on the script for this performance and as I've started to rehearse and stage uh, this work. Um, what cycles, defined broadly, do I want to sustain in my own communities? What am I inheriting? And what am I passing down? And so in closing my time with you today, uh, I ask you to consider those questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aisha, for such moving performances that you shared with us today. I was um, uh, particularly touched when, when you said um, uh, that, we, that we're collecting alternative records of, of your movements with the paint onto the fabric uh, that and the different garments. And uh, in a way, it ties you, you know, it's, it's, I was thinking that it's not an accident that we, we are talking about healing and repairing, and we are looking at. Uh, repairing um, the colonialism, the, the, the horrors of colonialism, slavery. We talked about the Sami people and the indigenous and folk uh, uh, people, and, and uh, Matthew and Ruben also talked about that. 